So I'm delighted to be here. I'm uh, very grateful that my students and colleagues and uh, the ASBMB has honored me with this award. Um, today I'm going to tell you a story um, about when good ribosomes go bad. The um, essence of the story involves a patient mutation in a rare human congenital disease. And I was very struck this morning when Francis Collins was talking about how um, uh, he has devised a way to look at how basic science publica publications influence the eventual clinical outcomes. And it's, it's a triangle where the publications are on the bottom and eventually it uh, 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 pinnacles in um, some uh, clinical relevance. The um, point that he was making was about immunotherapy for cancer. Um, but, but I have kind of a different point of view than Francis presented this morning. I'm studying patient mutations because they inform um, our basic understanding of fundamental mechanisms of cell growth and division, and in my case, how ribosomes are made. So let me remind you that ribosomes are made in the cell nucleolus. The cell nucleolus is a non-membrane bound cytological compartment within the nucleus. It forms around the RDNA loci in diploid eukaryotic cells. Um, there are 10 of these at the acrocentric chromosomes. And an increased number and size of the nucleoli is associated with a poor cancer prognosis. And on this side, we see staining of nucleoli in, in um, a mammalian tissue culture cell line with the um, monoclonal antibody fibrillarin that was uh, developed uh, very close by. And uh, if you look closely, you can see that there's a smiley face because people who work on nucle nucleolus are happy. <laughs> so ribosome biogenesis is metabolically expensive. It requires all three RNA polymerases, RNA polymerase one, two, and three. Ribosomal RNA transcription accounts for 60% of all cellular transcription. A yeast cell, a budding yeast cell, contains 200,000 ribosomes. And a growing yeast cell produces over 2,000 ribosomes per minute. So yeast are a good model system for studying how ribosomes are made. And these facts were taken from this wonderful review that John Warner wrote um, called uh, uh, in, in Tibbs. On this side, you see the famous Oscar Miller chromatin spreads. And these are famous because in 1969, uh, these were on the cover of Science because it was the first time that RNA had ever been visualized. These are chromatin spreads from amphibian oocytes. This particular version happens to be from um, the obituary for Oscar Miller from a couple of years ago that Steve McKnight, my collaborator, Ann Beyer, and my former professor in college, Joe Gall, wrote. And as you can see on, on, uh, on this picture, it, it illustrates some features of, of the RDNA loci. They're repeated loci, one comes after the other. And you can see the transcription starts at one end and ends at the other end, the smaller transcripts being the, the, the newer ones, the more nascent transcripts. It's often been termed a Christmas tree with the trunk of the RDNA, uh, the trunk of the tree being the RDNA, the branches being the rRNA and a Christmas tree instead of a pine tree because of the knobs on the end. And those knobs, which are small in these because this is amphibian oocytes, are much bigger in the similar spreads from yeast. And my laboratory purified those over 15 years ago and identified the com components of a new large ribonuclear protein, which we call the SSU processome. So um, since our very basic work, there have been a number of human diseases of making, making ribosomes that have been described. And these are called ribosomopathies. The ribosomal DNA is transcribed as a single transcript that encodes the 18S ribosomal RNA, the 5.S, and uh, the 28S ribosomal RNA. They must be processed through a series of cleavage steps to make the mature small subunit of the ribosome, small and large subunits of the ribosome. In addition to the cleavage steps, they undergo 2 primal methylation of the RNA itself and, uh, and also pseudouridylation. The ribosomal RNAs must also be folded correctly with their um, uh, scores of ribosomal proteins. So you can see there are many, many steps that must occur for this process to happen uh, correctly. There are a number of human diseases of making ribosomes, and I've illustrated some of them here. This is not a complete list. Uh, we work on a few of these. Um, we've done some work on Treacher Collins syndrome, which is a disease, uh, congenital disease of cranial facial development that affects development of the lower jaw. It's linked to uh, mutations in RNA polymerase 1 transcription factors, and we've described a couple of these. 
um, uh, the mutation that I'm going to talk about uh, to uh, you today is a mutation, uh, uh, a human disease called ANE syndrome. That stands for alopecia neuroendocrine syndrome. And this syndrome affects um, uh, processing, at least I'll show you that it will, of the um, RNA that makes the large subunit. So we call the ribosomopathies mysterious in this review we wrote in Science a couple years ago because um, of their tissue proclivity. That is, is, you can have a disease of making ribosomes that affects the bone marrow, and you can end up with bone marrow failure. You can have, have a disease of ribosomes that affects development of the face, and, ha and have an abnormal looking face, or something called oligodontia when you're miss missing your teeth. Or in one case, another one we study, you can have abnormal development of the liver and have a, a cirrhosis of newborns. So, all the, so we think of ribosomes as being monolithic entities, the same in all cells, but yet they're giving these different symptoms. And so that's led to the idea of specialized ribosomes. Perhaps there are different ribosomes in different cells, and we like to think of it a little bit differently. Perhaps there are uh, different ways of making ribosomes, in other words, specialized ribosome biogenesis. And um, this picture here is the artistic rendering of the, of the science magazine art department, and this is the ribosome if it were a jellyfish. And this is the small subunit, but they got it right, and that's holding the, um, the messenger RNA. And the large subunit with the two tRNAs, you can kind of see through this jellyfish, and the peptide coming through the exit tunnel. So um, the large ribosomal subunit is, uh, maturation is carried out by a large ribonucleoprotein called the LSU prososome. And so here again, we have the processing diagram with the nascent transcript. It must be processed through a series of steps and I've not indicated them for the 18S, and there's a, a, a subsequent series of steps that must occur to make um, the, these two um, parts of uh, the uh, large subunit. It forms around the 27 pre-RNA, pre which is indicated here, and there are over 90, 90 different biogenesis factors that dynamically associate with the LSU processome. So several years ago, my graduate student, Kat McCann, and all of the work I'll tell you about today was carried out by CAT with one exception, decided to map the protein-protein interactions within the LSU processome. And at the time she started, uh, uh, there were only a handful of interactions known, and they're shown here. And what we hope to get, and this is what it looks like, is this hairball where there are a lot of interactions. And, it, and by doing that, we hope to uncover novel regulatory complexes with the goal of de developing testable hypotheses that would, uh, with which we could look at the function and organization of these biogenesis factors. And so we used to do this the yeast 2 hybrid system, which was pioneered by Stanley Fields. And the yeast 2 hybrid system is based on the idea that uh, transcription factors are modular. They contain both a DNA binding and a DNA activation domain. And you can separate them and fuse them to your proteins of interest. And if the two proteins interact, you can drive a reporter gene. And this is actually a hand-drawn diagram from Stanley Field's first grant application, which I'm very glad that he got. So uh, we Kat did this, these experiments. He, she did a 75 by 75 matrix uh, for protein-protein interaction. She did it three times in two different strains and uh, developed some very good data and uh, developed a, a way to quantitate, quantitate this data using a high-confidence score. In the end, we had 232 high-confidence interactions. 211, these, 211 of these were new. This is a full, four-fold increase from current knowledge. And we in, independently validated 20% of these by a co precipitation method. So we feel pretty uh, certain about our data. But as you can see, that um, in looking at this, there's very little functional information that you can draw from it. So instead, we would draw out little bits, one at a time. And one thing we notice that there are several hub proteins within the um, uh, LSU processome. And one of these concerns this protein NOP4. And so NOP4 interacted with 22 proteins in our LSU processome. I am not saying it interacts with 22 proteins all at the same time. Hub proteins were first described by Mark Vidal to interact with many more proteins than average. They're found in the center of these interactome networks that we've um, shown to you today. They're more likely to be essential proteins, and NOP4 is one. They tend to be more abundant, and they're speculated to be associated with human disease. So what do we know about NOP4? It's an essential protein in budding yeast that's required for LSU assembly. 
It contains four RRM domains. RRM stands for RNA recognition motif. These are often presumed to be RNA binding domains. It uh, unexpectedly cross-links to the pre-RNA, and this is work of Sander Groneman using a cross-linking method. Genetic depletion of NOT4 impairs growth and assembly of the um, large subunit of the ribosome. It's involved in processing in, uh, in uh, one of the uh, uh, sequences in the pre-RNA, and mutation of the RMs one by one impairs growth and assembly. However, we also know that mutation of the human ortholog of NOP4, a protein called RBM28, causes a &E syndrome in humans. And this is a disease called alopecia neuroendocrine syndrome. It's autosomal recessive. It causes baldness, mental retardation, and short stature. It was found in a kindred of five uh, young men, a consanguinous marriage. And some of the degrees of baldness are shown here. This is complete baldness in the middle and a full head of hair, but no axillary hair and no body hair. Um, also uh, accompanying this mutation is oligodontia, which is of interest to me because of the connection to the RNA polymerase one mutations. So these children are missing teeth. It was mapped to an amino acid substitution in RBM28, a leucine 351 to proline mutation. This mutation lies in the third RRM of RBM28. It's predicted to disrupt the first alpha helix. And patients have significantly fewer mature ribosomes. So this um, disease is called a ribosomopathy for two reasons. One, the RBM28 protein and its ortholog NOP4 are both nuclear proteins. And because of this single experiment where they took patient fibroblasts and, and counted ribosomes in the cytoplasm and were able to show that there were fewer ribosomes, there's been um, a, no experiments done to address the molecular mechanisms of this disease. Fortunately, um, NOP4 and RBM28 are conserved from yeast to humans. They're 26% identical, 34% similar. They're also identical in the third RRM. And I told you the a and &E syndrome mutation occurs at uh, leucine 351 in the human protein. And the orthologous mutation in yeast would be L306P. And uh, the alignment is shown there. So uh, we sought to define the molecular pathogenesis of a &E syndrome by asking whether the a &E syndrome mutation in yeast, NOP4, affects its function in ribosome biogenesis. We can do this very, very easily in yeast. So we use a haploid yeast, and you can tell it's budding because there it is. And we uh, take the endogenous, uh, we put the endogenous uh, gene NOP4 under the control of a galactose-inducible glucose-repressible promoter so in galactose, the cells grow, but in glucose, it represses expression of NOP4. And so at the same time, we express NOP4 wild type, or the NOP4 mutant, on a, on a plasmid in yeast uh, constitutively. And that way, we can test whether the mutant is functional or not. And in this Western blot panel, uh, it just shows us that we can see that the endogenous NOP4 is expressed when the cells are grown in galactose, but it's not expressed when cells are grown in glucose. Likewise, the, the um, proteins expressed from the plasmid are, not ex uh, are expressed all the time because they're constitutive. And when we use empty vector, which is the negative control, which is what EV stands for, we see no expression at all, and this is just a loading control. So protein expression is good, but does the, the mutant protein complement growth? And the answer is here. So these are serial dilutions in the situation where the endogenous NOT4 is expressed and then when the endogenous NOC4 uh, is repressed and only plasmid bore NOC4 is expressed, empty vector doesn't complement at all. Of course, this, the wild type complements are just fine. And the mutant, this is the a &E syndrome mutant, uh, is partially complements. And so we then went on to ask, does um, this partial complementation go along with a defect in pre-RNA processing? Because often with ribosomopathies, the, the growth defect is accompanied by defects in, in, in making ribosomes. So here we have the um, pre-RNA processing diagram, again, starting with the pre-ribosomal RNA, um, uh, focusing mostly uh, on the um, two RNAs that make up the large subunit, the 5.8s and 25s. We first looked at mature levels of um, the ribosomal RNAs, the 25s and the 18s. When we, when we complement with that empty vector, uh, we uh, get loss of um, 
both the 18S and the 25S. When uh, we complement with wild type, um, that's what we would consider normal. So this is the null and this is normal. And when we complement with um, the NOP4 bearing the ANE syndrome mutation, we get an intermediate phenotype. And when we repeat this three times and quantitate and uh, look at the 48 hour um, uh, uh, quantitation, you can see that the null is here, the wild type is here, and that there's an intermediate level of 25S ribosomal RNA being made, uh, suggesting that the uh, NOP4 mutation affects production of the 25S ribosomal RNA. And this can be seen better than when you probe for the precursors that make the 25S ribosomal RNA using uh, radio-labeled probes um, to ITS2, where the empty vector doesn't complement at all. The wild type gives you the, um, the, the normal level of uh, pre-RNAs that you would see. And the, uh, the L, L306P mutation gives you an intermediate level, which is probably best observed here in the quantitation lanes where there's a, uh, a reduction in the 27S RNA levels as there's a reduction in the 7S RNA levels. So this suggests to us that the ANE syndrome mutation is a hypomorphic allele. It's partially functional. And this is, of course, what you would expect because this allele is compatible with life. RBM28 is an essential gene in humans, as NOP4 is an essential gene in yeast. So we hypothesize that the mutation, the ANE syndrome mutation, might be interfering with protein-protein interaction. And this was based on the observation that NOT4 was a hub protein in the LSU processome. So we tested that by doing a yeast to hybrid assay. And first we tested that both were expressed to the same uh, level. And this is just a loading control on non-selective medium. When we ask if the two proteins interact, you can see the empty ve vector control is empty. NOP4 wild type interacts with um, each of these five proteins that it was predicted from our original screen to interact with. But when we introduce the mutation, we find very interesting results. We see reduced interaction in this case between NOC2 and NOP4 bear bearing the ANE syndrome mutation. We see absent interaction with these three proteins, MOC5, NOP4, and uh, I can't read that one actually, NSA2. But with DBP10, we see no loss of interaction. So what this tells us is that the ANE syndrome mutation confers loss of protein-protein interaction with some of NOP4's interacting partners, but not with all of them. And so are the, are the RMs 3 and 4 necessary and sufficient for growth, ribosome biogenesis, and protein-protein interaction? We came to ask this question because we know that the ANE syndrome mutation occurs in RM3, and maybe there's something about the special about these two RMs. And so we tested whether the RMs themselves were sufficient for growth in pre-RNA processing. And we did uh, what in the lab we call a Frankenstein experiment. And what we did is we took NOT4 and chopped it in half and asked if this N-terminal 2 RMs were sufficient for growth in pre-RNA processing. And li likewise, whether the C-terminal 2 were sufficient for growth in pre-RNA processing. And then expressed both in trans and asked if that even worked better. And th these are just serial dilutions looking for growth at various temperatures. Empty vector doesn't complement at all. The NOP4 wild type uh, complements fine. That is, of course, the positive control. The NOP4 N terminus is dead as a doornail. It doesn't complement at all. It looks like, just like the empty vector. But in contrast, the NOP4 C terminus does complement. It complements a little at 30 degrees and even more at 23 degrees, suggesting that the C, C terminal 2 RMs are necessary and sufficient for growth. And when we express the 2 in trans, shown here, we actually can restore growth almost to normal, suggesting that there's some interaction among those uh, two parts of the protein uh, in trans, normally in cells. We went on to do northern blots that would pair with these growth curves and found that the northern blots actually mimic what we see here. Uh, we can re when we restore growth, we get back a, nor a normal northern blot. So these results suggest that RMs 3 and 4 are, are um, very important um, for uh, cell growth and for pre-RNA processing, perhaps they're the, the parts of um, NOP4 that actually bind protein. And so we tested that using a different kind of two-hybrid assay. In this case, we tested the wild-type NOP4 against all of those 22 proteins. We used empty vector as a negative control, so that's what negative is. And we took the Frankenstein pieces, taking the first half of the NOP4 RMs 1 and 2, 
and saw that none of them uh, will interact with any of the proteins, yet not, not four RMs, three and four interact with each and every one of them. So this uh, tells us that the 2C ter terminal RMs of not four are necessary and sufficient to mediate protein-protein interaction, and they were all um, they were also partially uh, uh, they also partially complemented growth and partially restored pre-RNA processing. So they're they're critical, and remember that the ANE syndrome mutation occurs in the third RM. So perhaps you're worried about the fact that RNA binding motifs are binding proteins quite nicely and. Um, uh, uh, I don't think you should be worried about that. We're not the first person to observe that RMs are actually protein binding motifs. It's been observed in a number of pairs of RNA splicing factors, and this is just another example, the first in ribosome biogenesis. So um, we went on to uh, ask this question, how does the a &E syndrome mutation affect RBM28 RM3 protein structure? So we get a defective allele, we get a hypomorphic protein when we introduce the ANE syndrome mutation uh, into NOP4. In this case, we, to do structural analysis, we had to switch back to the human protein, and we had to do that because the yeast protein was not soluble for the experiments we wanted to do. And we did these experiments in collaboration with our long-term co collaborator, Tracy Tanaka Hall at NIEHS, and her two postdocs, Takamasa Teramoto and Jun Zhang. And they did both circular dichroism and NMR analysis of the RM3 alone with and, with, with and without the um, RBM28 um, ANE syndrome mutation. And the uh, CD showed that um, the introduction of the mutation caused the protein to, to be a, a total random coil. And the NMR analysis shows a huge difference between the wild type and the mutant protein. So here the black uh, is the wild type, and the red is the uh, mutant protein, now leucine 351 to proline. And this indicates that the mutation introduces disorder to the backbone and uh, creates a disordered RM3. And this is a, a, a mock-up, because we don't have a crystal structure, of the um, RM3. It occurs in the first alpha helix, which is shown here. You can see the beta sheets and the two alpha helices. These are just two views. So this single mutation disrupts the backbone enough to disturb the whole um, RM. So our proposed molecular pathogenesis of ANE syndrome, and this would be the alpha helix where the mutation occurs, is that normally this alpha helix or some part of it binds proteins. Uh, I've shown it here just binding to one of the proteins. Uh, when the ANE syndrome is introduced, you get a disrupted um, uh, uh, RM3 structure so that it can no longer bind proteins with a take-home message that the a &E syndrome mutation in RBM28 or NOP4 gives rise to defective protein folding, which in turn abrogates protein-protein interactions and causes defective pre-large ribosomal subunit RNA processing, thus revealing one aspect of the molecular pathology of this human disease. And so I'd like to acknowledge Kat McCann, who did all the work, except for the NMR and CD that I showed you, which was done by Tracy Hall's lab. I'm accompanied by two of my students, Katie Farley and Sam Sandali, and this is Sam, and this is Katie. And uh, Katie had a poster earlier this week, Sam had a poster today, and, ha and has a talk tomorrow. And so they're avidly participating in this meeting, they're first-time comers. And I'd like to thank my funding sources, and I'd like to thank you for listening.